Valve Software, inception date 1996. It was here in Kirkland, Washington, where Gabe Newell and Mike Harrington started their own company after spending years working for Microsoft. Since then, Valve has become a powerhouse in the world of PC gaming with its digital storefront Steam and its vast selection of popular multiplayer games. But it was Valve's first foray into game development that put the company on the map. You're watching DF Retro. I'm John, and today we're going to go back and take a look at Half-Life, both in its original form and on consoles. Let's get started. The story of Half-Life begins just as Quake hit the market. The year was 1996 and Quake shook the world with its cutting edge full 3D graphics engine. While there were other engines prior to Quake which could do many things in 3D, including Bethesda's own X-Engine, there was nothing as fast and capable as the Quake 1 engine on the market, which of course led to licensing deals. Developers were all too eager to get their hands on this new engine in order to start building experiences in full 3D. But the fast pace of development during these days ultimately led many developers to its follow-up, It Tech 2, released just 18 months later in Quake 2. While many developers opted to make the jump to Quake 2 rather than continue working with the less capable id Tech 1 engine, Valve took its own approach. Rather than waiting for John Carmack and company to implement new features, Valve pushed forward with its own development by heavily modifying the Quake engine to support the features necessary for Half-Life. Many of these features were showcased in an early build of the game intended for the press. This Half-Life Alpha build hit the internet in 2013 and gave users a rare look into a game still in development. This version of Half-Life is very much unfinished and its Quake engine roots are quite evident, but many of the new features that were promised were already in place. Colored lighting and blending modes were now possible. Scripted sequences were taking form. AI flocking routines were present, and a skeletal animation system enabled much more detailed and complex animations across the board. The demo itself is simple and ultimately very limited. There are few weapons available, AI behavior is basic, and the levels are a mere shadow of what was to come. If you were reading about Half-Life in magazines back in 97, however, this demo is where all the associated screenshots and information originated from. There is a fair bit of content in this demo as well. In addition to the demo rooms, a huge chunk of the single player campaign was actually playable here. It's fascinating to see just how much was present in this very early version of the game. But in a move that Valve fans would soon become familiar with, much of this work was scrapped. Then, 14 months later, the game re-emerged. The game finally released, storytelling in first-person shooters was redefined. Many of the conventions we now take for granted today had never before been seen in 1998. Complex scripted sequences, massive set-piece moments, a rich narrative, and a cohesive continuous world were just a part of what made Half-Life a success. While it was not cutting-edge visually, it was a handsome game with a consistent art direction and a great sense of style. I first played the game on an AMD K6 233MHz with a 3DFX Voodoo 1 graphics card. It looked great at the time, but due to the weakness of the AMD CPU when running Quake Engine games, it didn't run quite as well as I had hoped, and some of the larger areas really struggled on this hardware configuration. We also have to mention the excellent DSP effects used for audio. The sound in the game was modified based on the environment in which you were standing, and it was quite impressive. But just as Half-Life hit the market, another major gaming event was taking place on the other side of the planet. The next generation of consoles was just beginning with the release of Sega Dreamcast in Japan. As newer, more advanced game consoles started to become a reality, the opportunity for introducing successful PC games to a new audience opened up. And so over the next couple of years, development would begin on ports of Half-Life for the Dreamcast and PlayStation 2. A portion of this effort was spearheaded by Gearbox Software. Gearbox, founded by members of 3D Realms and Bethesda, got its start creating an expansion pack for Half-Life. 
subtitled Opposing Force, people were hungry for new single-player content, and Randy Pitchford and friends were happy to oblige. It was a success, and its success ultimately led to more work. The next job, create a second expansion pack known as Blue Shift for the Dreamcast version of Half-Life. Now the actual Dreamcast port itself was being handled by a now defunct company known as Captivation Digital Laboratories. This would be their only product. The port itself was announced in early 2000 and would be delayed time and time again until ultimately being cancelled by Sierra, its publisher, due to changing market conditions. In other words, the Dreamcast was killed off and it no longer made sense to release it. This might have been the end of the story, but many years later, a version of the game was leaked onto the internet. This version was actually dated just one month before ship. Here's what it looks like. It's a faithful recreation of the original Half-Life, but it does have a lot of technical issues. Simply put, it just doesn't run well. At all. The frame rate is completely uncapped, and pockets of 60 FPS are punctuated by drops well into the teens. It also loads a lot. The original Half-Life took a unique approach to loading at the time. By breaking up levels into smaller chunks, the game could more quickly move from one area to the next, at least on the PC. When running on a console with an optical disk drive and only 16 megabytes of memory, however, things didn't really work out so well. The end result here is a constant barrage of very lengthy load screens that would pop up throughout the experience. But there were a lot of positive changes here as well. Character, weapon, and enemy models, for instance, were completely revamped on the Dreamcast with a much higher triangle count across the board. Some minor level design tweaks were present as well, and definitely added to the experience. The end result is a faithful port, limited by the hardware and some developer choices. We'll never know for certain if it could have been fixed, since the game was never officially released, but we can at least say that it performs faster than another Quake Engine port to the Dreamcast, Soldier of Fortune. Now that is a mess. There is, however, another port that was actually released. In the works as early as 1999, Sierra and Gearbox were in discussions to develop a version of Half-Life for the upcoming PlayStation 2. Straight away, it's clear that the presentation is more refined than on Dreamcast. It's evident right from the main menu, which now has a nice background music and instant transitions between different screens. The Dreamcast version, in comparison, slowly loads between every section, making navigation feel sluggish. The PS2 version also includes full support for 16x9 widescreen, something I actually discussed years ago with one of the game's developers who single-handedly pushed for this feature to be included. Well done. Once in the game then, we find a similar performance target to the Dreamcast version. 60 frames per second is the base frame rate, but slowdown does occur frequently. This opening tram ride actually serves as an interesting comparison point which highlights the speed difference between the two versions. You can see how quickly the performance can dip in both versions, but it's clear that the frame rate goes much lower on the Dreamcast. There are of course additional hitches that also appear on Sega's console. I think the big takeaway from this opening scene is really that the game should have been capped at 30 FPS on both systems. While the Dreamcast still drops below this level rather often, the PS2 could have at least turned in a very consistent level of performance at 30 FPS. As it stands though, the game jumps back and forth regularly between 30 and 60 far too often, leading to an inconsistent experience. By now you've probably also noticed the visual differences here. The PS2 version includes the updated models from the Dreamcast version, but also sports a number of new textures throughout, in addition to generally brighter levels. It's very evident in this scene. While we're here, take a look at the skybox. Color banding is extremely evident in the Dreamcast version, but absent on the PlayStation 2. Interesting. Some other differences. The game runs at 640x480 on the Dreamcast with full VGA support, which is excellent. On PlayStation 2, however, it runs at just 512 by 448 With a modded PS2, however, it is possible to run the game in progressive scan, which is very useful indeed. On the flip side, the Dreamcast version operates at a lower 16-bit color depth with lots of visible dithering, while the PlayStation 2 version runs using 24-bit color. Textures are once again handled differently with 8-bit palletized textures in use on the PlayStation 2 and VQ texture compression on the Dreamcast. 
Mipmaps are generated and used on the Dreamcast as usual, while the PS2 version does not use them. You can see this here as the texture moves away from the camera. Notice the layers on Dreamcast where the smaller textures connect. These are the mipmaps. This is absent on PS2 and produces sharper but noisier overall results. This scene also showcases higher resolution textures on the PS2. Look at the floor here. You can also see differences in level geometry in this scene. Check out the ceiling. We also notice that the compression on Dreamcast can cause weird artifacts with these animated textures. Another advantage in favor of PS2 is loading. On Dreamcast levels can take between 15 to 20 seconds to load, while the PlayStation 2 version loads each new area in around 4 seconds instead. It has a huge impact on playability. The PS2 version does benefit from smart data placement on the disc and preemptive loading in order to minimize the issue. While this could be thought of as a limitation of using burnt media, since the game was never officially released, but there are early review copies of the game on GD-ROM out there, and reviewers complained of the same issue. And while we're here, here's a look at the performance on PlayStation 2 during the sequence we tested on the Dreamcast earlier. As you can see, there is still plenty of slowdown happening on the PS2 here, but the overall and average frame rate are definitely much higher and the game remains much more playable. Ultimately, these two console versions are certainly interesting. Neither version offers a completely polished experience in 2016, but it's clear that the finished PS2 product is a much better way to experience Half-Life. So at this point, we have the original release, the Dreamcast version, and the PlayStation 2 version. But just a couple years later, a new way to experience Half-Life was released in the form of Half-Life Source. In the lead up to Half-Life 2, a game which I will definitely cover in the future, Half-Life Source was released as a demonstration of the new engine. It's a direct port of the original Half-Life using the Source engine. While most of the assets remain the same, this version benefits from engine-related improvements including enhanced water, physics, particles, and AI behavior. It's an interesting way to revisit Half-Life in that it preserves the original experience while polishing up some of the rougher edges. But there's another way to experience Half-Life. Welcome to Black Mesa, a complete reimagining of the original Half-Life. It started out as a joint project between two modders, but it would go on to gain upwards of 40 volunteers under the Crowbar Collective banner. Every single asset in the game has been remade from scratch and reimagined. It feels remarkably fresh today and is a great way to revisit the original Half-Life in 2016. It's still missing the very end of the game the Zen levels, but the majority of the experience is available now with lots of interesting changes to the gameplay and it is remarkable. It truly feels like a proper Valve project. Now that we've come this far, here's how the different versions of the original test chamber compare against one another. Quite an interesting thing indeed. Now the fact that Black Mesa even exists today and is being sold says a lot about Valve as a company. Valve has always supported modding with a very open stance towards its games, going all the way back to 1998 with Half-Life. This has spawned countless remarkable modifications to the game, including perhaps one of the biggest multiplayer games of all time, Counter-Strike. A game that continues to be played in droves even in 2016, and it got its start as a simple project based on the original Half-Life which just goes to show how important Half-Life really was. As a game, it redefined the first-person shooter genre. As a toolset, it paved the way for some of the most successful and ambitious mods and total conversions of all time. As a platform, Half-Life helped pave the way for Steam, the definitive PC marketplace of today. And as a company, Valve has continued to expand and grow in all directions, and it's all tied back into this one game. Which is why perhaps Valve continues to avoid creating the sequel that we all want. Just how do you follow up such an important game? But I'm getting ahead of myself here. 
Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Valve has already made one sequel, and it's called Half-Life 2. And yes, a future episode of DF Retro will be dedicated to Gordon Freeman's return. It's a complex story filled with delays, leaks, and the most remarkable port of all. Keep an eye on our channel for future episodes of DF Retro, including Half-Life 2. That's all for now. If you enjoyed this trip down memory lane, be sure to give us a like and subscribe. And until next time, stay retro.